But they build roads, so they're not evil and responsible when they do that. When they build roads, when they do things which are good for the people, that's good. Oh, so it's the people then. Either they're good or they're bad, but it's, it's nothing, nothing to do with oil itself. The it's it's the natural and it's blasphemy to say it's a curse. It's, yes, and it's eventually it's the people, the owners of the wealth. All right, Ramzi Salman, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to throw it open to the audience now. The motion is that this house believes that oil is more of a curse than a blessing for the Middle East. Lady in the second row. When uh, you say uh, liberated um, Kuwait from the Iraqi invasion and the second Gulf War, uh, I don't think uh, that liberation for free. I think the Gulf countries still paying for that liberation. Uh, and I think that uh, the oil is being a curse more than a blessing. And I address this question to Mr. Nawaf. Thanks. Um. Well, um, there was a lot, if, you, if you're talking about monetary compensation, yes. I mean, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia had to, pray, had to, had to basically foot most of the bill for the uh, uh, invasion at the time. That's absolutely correct, with, the, with other countries. But at the same time, oil is at the cause of having a man like Saddam Hussein and his regime out of power. There is hope. There is hope for 22 million people. There is hope for freedom. There, is, there are elections coming up next month. And we can go on about it. So was it worthwhile? Yes, it was worthwhile. Is it worthwhile that Saudi Arabia will be maybe spending another couple of billion dollars in aiding the Iraqi people, as was announced yesterday? Yes, it is worthwhile. Is it worthwhile that maybe Iraq could be used as an example for a potential democratic form of government? And, I, and the key word here is potential. Yes, for the region as an example. Yes, it is. So um, are we still paying for it? Uh, indirectly, I guess we are. But I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. A guy like Saddam Hussein is out of power, and that regimes such as his are no longer acceptable in the world. And if you, if you want to put oil as the cause of it, then oil is, it is the cause of it, and hence it's a bliss. Hussein Askari, you want to come in? As someone born in Iran, I can't let that go by. It was oil that gave Saddam Hussein the arms to invade Iran. It was oil that made the United States and the Western world interested in supplying chemical weapons that were used on Iranians. It was oil, money that Saudi Arabia and Kuwait supported Iraq with, to the tune of 40 billion on the part of the Saudis and 20 billion on the side of the Kuwaitis. And then to come and say, oil money liberated it? It's like digging a hole and filling it back up again, ladies and gentlemen. That is wrong. Yes, it's the mismanagement. Of course, you don't need to be a genius to figure out that the more resources you have, the more options you have, that's a fundamental economics 101, you're better off. But it's the way that you use it. And it's been used badly. It has been abused and misused. And it's not blasphemy. Ramsey Salman, yeah, you come in? you're defeating your own argument. Because you're talking, again, of management, bad management. The bad management is the curse, not the oil, not the wealth. That's not the curse. The curse is the bad management, and you said it yourself. That's just semantics. That's just splitting hairs, isn't it? Yeah. It's always the case of whether it's badly used or well used, isn't it? I mean, that's implied in the question. The curse is to have a bad leadership who misuse the thing. The other curse is to get a war to remove that bad leadership with an effect which is much more evil than the curse of oil. The gentleman up there has a question. Right at the back. Mr. Salman is insisting that it's the problem is uh, with management, bad management, bad governments. These governments did not come to power by elections, and the people cannot overthrow them. And they will continue to, to, they will continue to abuse power. So in this case, it will continue to be a, a curse. How come is oil a blessing if these governments are able to come to power without elections and stay in power, presumably, because of the revenues, that, oil revenues that keep them there? A sharp knife in a kitchen is a blessing when you want to cut something tough. But you can also use that knife to kill somebody. So the thing is there. It's how you use it. Oil is definitely a blessing. I owe my education, I owe everything to oil. If it wasn't for oil, I would never have the education I had. For me, it's a blessing. 
for many countries, for many people, it's a blessing. But if it's unfortunate case when it is in the wrong hands and misused, the income of it is misused, that's not the fault of the oil. It's the fault of the management. All right, there's a gentleman at the back who has his hand up. Can we get a microphone to him, please? My question is for the panel that's uh, arguing uh, for the motion. Don't you think that oil is the foundation in this region for development? I mean, as we've seen before, and I'm talking specifically for Qatar, uh, the main industry here was uh, pearl diving, and our friends, the Japanese, managed to develop a way to make it cheaper. If you have uh, such a strong natural resource here, such as oil and gas, then why don't you use it for development? I mean, oil is not a curse. Without oil, I don't think you'll be, ha you'll be having open education, I don't think you'll have open debates here, and I don't think you'll have a new science and uh, research center just across the street there. Thank you. Hussain Askari, you're shaking your head. Because I think that we are not here, as you said, Tim, we shouldn't be splitting heads. It says, I think the motion is very, very clear. For the Middle East, oil has been more of a curse than a blessing. It is implied in that question how it has been used. Of course, you don't have to be a genius to figure out that if you have something, you use it wisely, you benefit from it. We all know that. But it hasn't been used wisely. I agree with my friend. I will put my neck on the block. I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I will say the same thing if you have a sword, that sharp knife of yours, in the kitchen that's ready to cut. <laughs> I will admit it to you that if we use oil wisely, it's a benefit. We should have been investing this in abroad. We should have invested it domestically to generate future income. But we haven't done it. And that is why it has been more of a curse. We have used it to kill each other. That's what we've done. OK, Karen Ackley, very briefly, there are a lot of hands up and a lot of questions we want to get to. Yes, you all refer to education. Just to remind you that Lebanon, before the Civil War, unfortunately, had probably, most probably the best schools, the best hospitals in the region, and didn't need oil to do that. There's a lady in red who's been putting up her hand. Many years from now, do you, do you think that uh, these countries who have oil will be less independent of the foreigners who come ch uh, to work here? It's an excellent question. Wow. I mean, what this proves how the oil, how, how oil revenues have helped create an indigenous workforce. For example, in Saudi Arabia, 90% of the Aramco employees that deal with the oil fields, the engineers, you know, the geologists, are Saudi. They've been trained abroad. They go on scholarship and so forth. But they ultimately come back, and they're Saudi. The ones that work on the fields are Saudi. We just, did a, we just, we just finished doing an estimate. And it shows how, again, very specific in an industry, this is a, the oil industry inside Arabia, how due to this oil wealth, what it has created. So what's the answer to the question? Has created that there, there is already a lot of, there is less dependence, I mean, on, on, on the technical know-how. But because of the inter interoperability of, you know, of the global community today, there will always be some form of relationship where obviously certain technologies will be, uh, will be created in the West and so forth. So it won't be, a, the dependence is lessening, but there will always be a relationship. You right. can't, Karen you can't do otherwise. You want to say something very briefly? Yes, you refer to, the, to a national company, but don't forget that in the Gulf area, and the Middle East in general, the private companies are really struggling to replace expatriates by nationals. Private companies such as what? Look around you, read the newspapers, and you will what, see. What private? Oil industry company? Not only not in the oil industry, no, we're talking in the various industries. I mean, she was talking about the oil industry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Salman, you want to I think this is an element of the population. The population of the Gulf countries in uh, 1969 was 43 million total, including Iran. Now it's 123 million. They say three times as many. So the more you have population growth, and they develop, and then you will have less need for foreign uh, labor. This is only a question. But in the past, you, had, you did not have the population, and you did not have the qualified people. In time, with growth of population, because of the wealth as well, and better health services and uh, things, of, of course, there is an element that when people get rich, have less children. But this is not uh, the case. All right. All right. We'll just a reminder of the motion that we have at the moment. The House believes that oil has been more of a curse than a blessing for the Middle East.